I'd like to thank the friends of the Hadley Public Library who are sponsoring this event. Um, so this all started when our book club read Mr. and Mrs. Prince, and it was so well received, and we were all so fascinated by this story that I contacted Dr. Christina to see if she might be willing to come and speak. So we are very grateful to her for being here today. Uh, Gretchen Wilbur Krasina is the Paul Murray Kendall Professor of Biography and Professor of English at UMass Amherst. She's the author or editor of 10 books, four of them biographies. Several of the books are in Black British Studies, particularly the recently revised and updated Black England, A Forgotten Georgian History, Britain's Black Past, and Black Victorians, Black Victoriana. Her other books include biographies, Carrington, A Life, Francis Hodgson Burnett, a life about the author of The Secret Garden, and our focus for this evening, Mr. and Mrs. Prince, how an extraordinary 18th century family moved out of slavery into legend. A former dean at UMass, previously she was the first African American woman to chair an Ivy League English department while at Dartmouth. She appears frequently on American and British radio, podcasts, and television. She's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Ant Antiquarian Society, and has won prestigious grants from the Radcliffe Institute, Guggenheim, UMass, the University of Oxford, NEH, Fulbright, and others. And this year, she was awarded the Chancellor's Medal, the highest honor that UMass awards to its faculty. She is the 2023-2024 Beatrice Shepherd Lane Fellow, and she has also been awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship for 2023 in the category of Intellectual and Cultural History. And most recently, she has been awarded the Samuel F. Conti Faculty Fellowship Award. Please welcome Dr. Christina. You made me tired just <laughs> <laughs> I understand you've all read this book, so I don't think I have anything to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm glad you've read it. Um, you know, you, you know a lot of the things but I'll just give you a little kind of run up to it. One was that um, of all the books I've done, including four now, four editions of The Secret Garden, um, I don't know how, you know, people keep publishing these things and asking me to do stuff. And so I've edited four editions of that. Um, this week at work, today was my last day of classes, for two years since I won all these grants for next year and the year after, which is really great. Um, but this week I had to teach for one class, I was teaching Pride and Prejudice, and my other class I was teaching The Secret Garden, and I wake up in the morning and I think, well, this isn't such a bad job. This is what I get to do, <laughs> which is great. Um, believe it or not, none of the students in either of my classes had ever read either of them. Oh, wow. I was really amazed. Wow. A couple of the students had read The Secret Garden because their mothers had read it to them. Oh. Most of them had never heard of it, oh. which amazed me. Um, I had, I thought, well, Pride and Prejudice, I, why should I assign that? It's the, it's the rise of the novel. Why should I assign that? Everybody will know that one. <laughs> Not one person in the class um, had read it. Um, we did show some, I showed some clips of fan fiction. <laughs> some people are writing, I can't remember how many sequels now people are writing. In fact, I've, I've spoken several times to Jane Austen Society things, and I, the first thing I say when they ask me to give talks is, do I have to like put those little puppy sleeves on and the um pure wings? Because you know, these J Knights, they really take it seriously. Um, they said, no, I can wear my regular street clothes. <laughs> Very nice. But this one was a little different. I came about um, writing it because I was living in Guilford, Vermont, um, on the long dirt road in a house that we had built. And my mother, bless her heart, um, said, did you know that there used to be a black person who lived down here? It was like 250 years before I lived here. Um, but from my porch, I could look over the, if I looked over the mountain across the meadow, that was where their house was. Um, and so I said, no. And I, so I was really lucky. I applied for and got an NEH grant to write the story of these people thinking, I can just stay home for the next year and write this book. I'll go to the Guilford Historical Society, which is right down the road here, and I will just use what they've got and I'll write this story. Um, turns out that the, what they had was a single file folder of, of newspaper clippings from the 1970s. Um, there was certainly nothing to write a 
book from, and then it turned into a saga, because every one of my books takes six or seven years. To write a biography, it takes six or seven years. Mm -hmm. And with Frances Hodgson Burnett, I had, you know, her, her letters are everywhere, and she wrote a lot of things. And I don't know if you know, but she actually wrote 53 novels, most of them were, were for adults. She never would have imagined that The Secret Garden would have been a story that people would be interested in after that. And now it's the only one anybody remembers. <laughs> um, she, um, so I thought, okay, this will be great. I wrote that book, did all my research, was very dutiful, traveled, I went down to Tennessee, and I was in, she had lived in Tennessee, and I was talking to one of the librarians when I was doing my research, and they said, well, have you contacted her great-granddaughter in Dallas? And I went, what? <laughs> because nowhere did her name come up. So I got to, I, I called her up, and she said, well, you better come here. It turns out that in her garage, she had 40 boxes of letters, oh, <laughs> and she had photographs, paintings, all sorts of things. Now, I later helped her put those in the Princeton Library because I got really scared of all that stuff sitting with tornadoes raging around and all of that. Um, so these things take a long time. In fact, they came to visit me in Vermont and in Guilford. She and her husband at one point, because we'd known each other several years at that point, and her husband, I heard talking in the kitchen with my husband, and he said, so, Anthony, you've been living with Frances for seven years now. What do you think? And Anthony said, yes, I've been living with Frances for seven years now, and I want my wife back. <laughs> so it's like being on stage. You know, you do the same role over and over again. You inhabit that role. Well, we inhabited Abijah and Lucy. And when I realized that I was not going to be able to write this book by sitting down the street, you know, go down and writing this, um, I went at it for a year trying to find whatever I could find, and then I had to go back to work because I only had a year. And I turned to my husband, who was not an academic, he's not a researcher, he's not African American, he was, um, he worked as a computer programmer and then a marketing manager um, before that, and I said, I'm gonna need help here because I gotta go to work. And he said, okay, what do I have to do? And he learned how to do it so well that he found a lot of the major finds in this. He was, because if you, you get used to thinking that things are in a structured order, and they're not. So he would find things, because I would be very chronological about the papers or the libraries or any place I would be going. And we would be sitting there, and he would think for a minute. He said, you know, paper was scarce back then. Why do you think that they took all the town meeting records in order? And so he thought for a minute, flipped to the back of this big town meeting record book from the 18th century, and said, huh. And there were eight pages of town meeting records, all about Baija and Lucy, that nobody had seen in 250 years. So oh. Nobody looked at the back of the book because it wasn't supposed to be there. So nobody had known this. The other thing we were up against was this legend about them. We met people who insisted their, their ancestors had freed Baija. We met people who, which they did not. Um, we met all sorts of people who, who thought that they knew the story because it's on the internet. So if you look them up, you're gonna find the wrong story. So please don't do that. And then people believe what they find. And they see that, and they think, oh yes, that I know the whole story. Lucy argued a case in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. No, she did not. Um, and this was the story. In fact, I met a young graduate student once in an elevator. I forget where I was, and she said, please don't tell me that story's not true. She, I, she looked bereft. <laughs> and I said, I'm so sorry. She did argue it probably in front of the Vermont Supreme Court. That, Will that work for you? <laughs> so, but he came into this search with me, and a couple of things happened um, at that point. That was the first major smart thing I did, to say, you can do this. Um, and the second smart thing I did I was talk to my mother about who found this story in the first place. And as you know in the book, if you've read it, um, when I was researching the people who had owned Abijah Prince, I had gone down to 
was it? That was the Connecticut Historical Society. And I, I learned very quickly that you don't tell people what you're looking for because they will have preconceived notions. So I sat there in this very, actually very nice library in this very posh part of, um, outside of Hartford, I think it's West Hartford. And I said, <coughs> I said, I'm looking for this family, the Doolittle family. And so you got a folder or two out, there's some history there. I was looking, hoping there would be a probate because then I might find budget in there as a child. Um, and he was not there, but I learned some things about the family. Not too much, but enough. And they finally said, what are you looking for? And I said, well, this man who had been enslaved. And he, she just immediately cut me off and said, I'm sorry, we don't have much about African American history here. I wish I did. I wish I could say more. And I said, well, actually, I'm looking for these white people. <laughs> because they could tell me who lived in their house and you know what was happening. And that was just baffling to her. So I was most of the way through what I thought was all I could find about the early life of poor Elijah, who left um, Wallingford, Connecticut. Um, he was born in 1706 and got his way up to a family that had enslaved him. In, uh, I'm suddenly going to forget the year, because I've been teaching since 6, 7 this morning. <laughs> so that date's gone out. Um, he, um, so I, I, was, I, talk, I was going through everything, and I realized that um, the Doolittle family, his wife was married to uh, was a woman named Lydia Todd. And Lydia Todd was a familiar name to me. So my mother, who was a white genealogist, in Springfield, Massachusetts, I had such meticulous research that when she died, it took me three years to empty her house because she left me three or four rooms full of archives. Um, and I finally ended up donating them to the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And um, they named the entire collection after my mother, my late mother. She would have loved that. We also held for memorial service in the genealogical library in Springfield, Massachusetts. <laughs> because I found in her, her books a book that said, bury me in the library. <laughs> <laughs> we can arrange that. They wouldn't let us bury her there, but they did let us have the memorial service there. So I called her up and I said, well, I really need to know about this woman, Lydia Todd. This name sounds so familiar. And she said, well, don't get your hopes up. So I, I drove down from Vermont down to Springfield. And we went through one of her massive binders. She did not use a computer, by the way. This is all individually done. Um, she went to clerk's office. She's everything. And we were going up the list, down the list of, of the family. And finally she said, well, I'll be done. <laughs> and there's Lydia Todd. And I realized that Lydia Todd's sister um, was my part of my white ancestral family, mm -hmm. which means that the man I was researching was, in fact, owned by members of my white ancestral family. Wow. Um, I can't tell you how many people, no matter how many times I've told the story, insisted that I was descended from Baja and Lucy, because they couldn't imagine how I had this white ancestry. <laughs> I said, well, come to my house and <laughs> see us all. Um, and so that changed everything. Everything opened up after that. That discovery meant that I suddenly um, was hooked into some, and I, I don't want to sound very spiritual or woo-woo, but, yeah. but I felt that they had been waiting for somebody to tell this story and somebody. So we lived, we would take our pickup truck as we were living out in the country, go down the dirt road to where we knew their land had been. I know the people who own the land. So, which is great. I was just talking to them last week in fact, in Northfield. And I, we would sit in their cellar hole, and yeah, I don't tell anybody where it is. I refuse, because um, people keep wanting to go. And I tell them, no, I won't tell you where it is, because it's private property. And we don't want people going there and taking rocks out of their cellar hole. It's, someone told me later, it's the only extant uh, house that they know that had belonged to African Americans that they knew of, and so that you know, we don't want that. The, the road is called the Bajan Prince Road now, which is mm -hmm. great, um, but I don't identify the property in its location. 
So we would go there and sit there in mud season, you know, that's why we had to take the truck. Mm -hmm. And one day I was just sitting there and I just, I don't know how to explain it, but I saw them walk out across the road. Not in a way that I actually, you know, but I saw them and he was like wiping his brow and they just stood there and said, tell our story. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> and this is it. And I said, you know all this, but I'll just go through some pictures. This picture is the street in Deerfield. Most of you may know that. The street is called The Street. It's the main street in Deerfield. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this was not when they lived there because there were no cameras. <laughs> when I first wrote the book, my publisher, the publicist, I'm sure a very nice young woman asked if I had any photographs of Bajan and Lucy, and I said, well, you know, you have to invent photography, and they were in the 18th century, this is what happened. Um, they later had they hired someone, someone later hired someone to uh, make a drawing of them, a painting, which was lovely, and I looked at it, and I said, these people look like they're from 1940s. He was wearing a suit, she had, like, hair that had been straightened and combed up, and I said, a beautiful button-up dress. And I said, these were 18th century farmers. <laughs> these were not people from 1940s Manhattan. <laughs> and he could not get his head around it. I said, please don't put that picture out there. There is a painting that was somebody did of Lucy, but it is not. It was an imaginary painting. The is of painting. So anyway, I start this journey and try to track down where they came from, how it happened, what do you do when there are no letters? There are no diaries. There are no pictures. There's only ledger books of other people, by other people. There are only indexes in the backs of books where you could try to trace something from one page to another. Some weeks you would go a whole week without finding anything, and then all of a sudden there was something. So you track one little thing after another. And what I ended up doing was making a spreadsheet that was everything that was related to them in some way or another. I put in the spreadsheets. And then it was by person, it was by date, by location, and what the item was, or the quotation that I could find. It ended up being 150 pages. And from that spreadsheet, because I could sort then by date. And then I found a template for any month of any year. And I printed out blank templates of the whole time that they were married, even before. And then that spread them on my floor and then put into them the things I had put on the spreadsheet. And I could start to tell where they had been and when. When they were at home in Guilford, when they were away, which meant that they were probably, um, and when they were home in Deerfield. And then when they were away and it was blank, I realized that's Guilford. They're up there clearing the land and the kinds of things they were buying. So I read almost all the relevant ledger books in historic Deerfield. And um, not only did I have to read it, but I had to learn how to do 18th century accounting <laughs> uh, because they did not use the same kind of accounting systems. They had three kind of monetary systems. They were, they were dollars, mainly Spanish dollars. They were English pounds and shillings. And there was one other one, some a, a gold one that I can't remember. And that's how I was able to, to figure out all the stuff. It took a long time, and there were two weeks, <coughs> which was good. Um, so we finally realized that uh, Hugh Hall, who lived in Boston, he was originally from Barbados. He was a merchant. He his parents had wanted him to be a minister, but he decided that he wanted to go into business. So he had a shop. Um, where Faneuil Hall stands today. And he was Harvard educated, and even though he wanted to be a minister, he did very well in business. And among the things that he sold, because I found some of his records at Harvard, were people. You don't necessarily think of that. You don't think about New England. But in fact, there was a lot of slavery. I mean, right down the road here, yeah, there, yeah. there was enslaved people. Um, and so he, he was trying to figure out how he could have come to own Lucy. How could she have found it? Well, she had said that she'd come from Bristol, which is today Rhode Island, but in those days it was still Massachusetts. 
So I, I knew some things about that, and she said that to, to someone. So I knew that he had gone to Harvard, and at Harvard he had several good friends who used to come in, and they, they came into the shop from various places at the same time. One was a man named Terry, and the other was a Williams, Stephen Williams, who lived in Long Meadow. His brother is Elijah Williams. So we know that he sold people. We know that these people ended up being somehow involved in Lucy's life. And then right after they came into the shop, right before they came into the shop, I saw this, we found this ad. Several likely Negro men, women, boys, and girls, some of which arrived about a week ago to be sold by Hugh Paul. We know how much a slave person cost and what he was selling them for, and we know that these two people came into the shop. So as far as I know, this is the ad that at the, from which Lucy was sold in this shop. She was sold to, a, to Terry, who lived in Menden, in the middle of the state. So she didn't get to Deerfield as young as people thought. But she was very young when she first arrived. And she ended up probably in Deerfield around age 10 or 11 or 12. This is the street again. And that's much what it would have looked like in her time. And along the street are lots of houses um, if you've been up there. None of, some of them are original, some were moved later on. Um, and this is the Wells Thorn house where she lived after she moved in there. Um, and this was much as it looked at her time. Actually, it's gone through some iterations. Um, it, it's, it looks more like this now. It looks white in here, but it's actually blue. And as far as I understand it from the people of Deerfield, the, the wooden part was where the original house was, where she would have been living. Um, with the Wells family. They had no children, and they had the only other person living in the house was an enslaved man named Caesar, so that he probably slept in the attic, Lucy may have slept in front of the fireplace. And the house actually is pretty interesting if you go through it. Um, this is the bedroom. This is the master bedroom in the new edition. This is the fireplace that Lucy may have slept in front of in cold weather in the original part of the house. And you know, stepping in and out of it, imagine being with a girl with her skirts, stepping in and out of this fireplace. Um, I had always read that fire was the second leading cause of women's deaths after this time, after childbirth, but I don't know if that's true or not. Somebody said it was apocryphal, but it's easy to see when you see the fireplace and okay, she had to step in and out of it, how that might have happened. And this was the room, um, also where the Wells slept, and where Lucy and Abigail, Abigail Wells, did spinning. And later, when um, um, Ebenezer Wells ran a tavern, and Lucy worked in the tavern. People would go work in the fields, and they'd stop and have lunch at the tavern, and they would have drinks in the evening. And there's another fireplace in this one. This is the little pantry where Lucy and Abigail made and turned cheeses and they stored wooden and pewter dishes. Um, and that's where she would have been in there all the time working. And apparently this window in the old part of the house was added when the house was renovated, first renovated by the store of Deerfield. And the art diamond paints were not part of that uh, architecture at the time. This is the side door to the old house. And this is where Lucy would have entered and exited as she ran errands or worked in the garden block, which was next to the door. And as far as I understand, they kept a rifle by the back door in case of attack. Um, so that would have been propped up by the door, too. Bar's Fight is the poem that we know. It's the only poem we know, but we know there must have been others. But it was read, written in a kind of sing-songy ballad way. I met, when I first did the book, I met a woman in New Hampshire who told me that her grandmother had been made to memorize this poem. It was taught in schools. Nobody knew it was written by an African American woman. And so that but her grandmother had to memorize this and all the children in this New Hampshire small town knew this poem. 1746, the Indians did an ambush lay, some very valiant men to slay, the names of whom I'll not be out. Samuel Allen like a hero thought, and though he was so brave and bold, his face no more shall we behold. Eliezer Hawks was killed outright before he had time to fight, before he did the Indian Sea, was shot and killed immediately. 
Oliver Amston, he was slain, which cost his friends much grief and pain. Samuel Amston, they found dead, not many wads off from his head. Adonijah Gillette, we do hear, did lose his life, which was so dear. John Sadler fled across the water and so escaped the dreadful slaughter. Eunice Allen, see the Indians coming and hoped to save herself by running, and had not her petticoat stopped and the awful creatures had not caught her, and Tommy hopped her on the head and left her on the ground for dead. <coughs> Yet young Samuel Allen, a lap a day, was taken and carried to Canada. This was not even published until 100 years after it was composed, and it was published, oddly enough, in the Springfield Republican newspaper. That was the first place in life. That's where I found it. Across the street from the Wells Thorn House is the Elijah Williams shop, and as it would have looked in later years, and Elijah Williams became a very important person in their lives. Uh, for one thing, he married them. For another thing, I just served under him in the, in, the, in the French and Indian War. And he was very prosperous, one of the Williams families, the river gods, they called them, because they made so much money. And they shipped their stuff up and down the Connecticut River. This I like to show, even though this is not necessarily someone you would think of. But this is a grip of hull. Bijah, once he got himself free, um, lived with a hull, Amos Hull, who lived in Northampton and Haddon. So he, Agrippa, who later started the catering business in Stockbridge, lived out there. You can see him in his full kind of catering gear. Bijah and Lucy, as one of their sons, worked for him in Stockbridge for a while. But I like to look at these because I look at his eyes and I said, this is the eyes of a man who may have laid eyes <laughs> and by Jay Lucy. And that to me was very meaningful because we don't have many, many things. So how it happens, by just living in Northfield, he lives there, he gets there when he's an adolescent and he stays there till he's a man in his 50s. Northfield was the back of beyond at that time. There was not much, you know, going on, the, you know, the do little, has, starts to have children, and the house gets crowded. Uh, there's soldiers, there's the French and Indian Wars, they build a stockade around the house. Baija had a gun, because everybody had guns, because you had to protect yourselves, and also for hunting. Uh, so we knew that he was there. And the last thing he could have imagined as a man in his 50s is that he was going to later get married, have all these children, and be, have a book written about him. Uh, so this is, to me, a really important thing. What happens if he decides he wants to change his life? Because he's fed up. He's lived in enslaved, in outside of no place, um, and he doesn't have money, he doesn't have anything, but what he wants to do is have a different life. And the reason he wants to have a different life is that he's been, he knows he's got friends who have married and who have lived in this area. And he thinks, maybe I can do some of this. So what does he have to do? He has to get free. He's got to become a registered voter. He pays a poll tax. And then he has to get married. And Lucy, who's 25 years younger than him, is sitting in this house right across the street from Elijah Williams and Shaw. This is something Anthony found in the Springfield um, you know, it, it was actually in with the, it wasn't with the, it's with the records of, not people, but property records. And he finds this manumission, um, it's the only one of a person in the basement of the Springfield um, archive. And it says, no old man by these presents that I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to read them a little straight, but I'll do it this way. Aaron Burt of no, uh, Northfield in the county of Hampshire and province of the Massachusetts Bay in New England, Weaver, for sundry and good considerations we hereunto have moving, have manumitted, released, and forever discharged by Negro man or servant or slave named Abijah alias Prince. Now, Aaron Burton never owned Abijah Prince. <laughs> and so what's this little fascinating is how did this come about? Well, we know that Baijin was able to, to serve in the French and Indian War. A lot of servants did. He was able to do that, and then he gets the pay. Did the pay go to Doolittle? Um, he's dead around this time. And did it go to, to his wife Lydia? Did it go to the children? Um, we think, we're pretty certain, that he went to Aaron Burt, who actually ended up being a shaker, so he was very religious and did not believe in slavery. 
And he says, I can give you my pay if, if you will buy me from the Doolittle family and then we'll free me. And we think that's exactly what happened. And so Aaron Berg, we even found a piece of paper where Aaron Berg practiced writing a manumission. He got a copy of one and then he practiced writing it out. And now he's filled it out and put Baija's name in here. And Baija becomes free. And then he decides this is his moment. So he goes into Baija and Lucy get married in Elijah Williams' shop. We don't know if it was in the shop or where it was. There's no record of Lucy being freed, but we're pretty certain that they just freed her once she married Baija. So this is the marriage certificate. Mar uh, Baija Prince and Lucy Terry servant to Ed uh, Ebenezer Wells were married May 4, uh, May 17, 1756 by Elijah Williams. Today's today. today. <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> So they get married, they move to this property that is, I don't know if you can see it, right at the top, it says Abijah's Brook. Yeah, yeah. It's a piece of land that the Wells family owns, so they let Abijah and Lucy settle on it. And there they start to have children in that family. Um, they, they, at one point, Abijah decides that he's going to register the birth, so this is actually sitting in the town clerk's office in Greenfield. Mm -hmm. um, and it has the names of their children, Caesar, Deruxa, Drusilla, um, Festus, Tatne, and Abijah Prince Jr. And the reason to register the vote, the, the births are, A, it proves they're not enslaved people, and B, there's a stamp tax coming in from Britain, which meant that they paid a tax on every document he did. So if he gets him under the wire, it's all the births registered. And then he is, the kids are safe. Um, after a while, Elijah Williams gets a, a lot of land. He's deeded it in the new colony of Vermont. And in order to keep your land, you have to clear five acres. And you have to give straight pine trees also to the British government so they use them for masts. So that's when we start seeing Baijiu disappearing. And he goes to, um, he's, we think, Gil, Gilbert, where he's starting to clear this land. And then he comes back and he buys things like timber. Um, enslaved people don't buy things that you build houses with. They buy things like silver buckles, the things that make themselves happier in their enslavement, just little things. We found a record of a man buying a, a parrot in a cage, and he's an enslaved man, and this is probably something that gives him some joy. He probably got a little bit of money from hunting or doing something. But buy just buying stuff that people you buy to build a house. And then Lucy starts buying stuff, and we realize that there's going to be a wedding because she starts buying thread and, and uh, cloth. She buys some men's cloth, and I think she makes buy a shirt. And then um, they finally get married and settle in and have these children. They then move to Packers Corner in Guilford. Um, they move to Guilford, but in, near Guilford in Packers Corner, which is not that far from where they were, is this tavern. And we think this is where this, uh, this um, attack on their property started. So we know that the people started at this tavern. They were probably hired by the man who owned the property across from Bijan and Lucy and Gilbert, and who was from Stonington, Connecticut, a very strong s slave state, by the way. Stonington had mm -hmm. slave plantations even. They would grow food in Stonington and sell it to slave plantations in Barbados. Mm -hmm. And that's how it worked. It was a very slave-centered economy. These people from who were set upon, you know, and being bribed to go attack them, go down to the Baja and Lucy's property. They set fire to their hay ricks. The kids are grown and pretty much gone at this point. And Baja and Lucy are really in desperate straits because they can't feed their livestock. They can't do that. They, they set pigs <coughs> on their property to destroy their crops. And so Baja is taught Lucy how to use the courts. And Lucy, it makes a lot of sense, now learns how to use the court system. Baijiu was very litigious. He would, we found so many court records. They were in New Fane, Vermont, in a room, in a building that was a former jail. And most of the 
the things that were all stacked up in old boxes like a maze. And Anthony was going through it. He finally found the boxes for the right years. And every document in it had been eaten by mice or something. So, but he able, was able to read them. And they, they wants to go back and take more notes. And they say, no, OSHA has condemned the building. <laughs> <laughs> and he made this great argument, which was, this is, a this is a public building, and these are public records. Therefore, the public has a right to have access to the records. And they let him in. Um, they didn't let anybody else in, but he went in. And we found all these court cases. If somebody owes you a dollar, you take them to court. I mean, if somebody doesn't pay a bill. So Baiju was taking people to court. One of the things he did was take two neighbors to court because they had attacked his small sons. And so they would go. This was right. Oh, somebody back up. Uh, they would go to the courthouse, which was in a house, which was in Houghton Tavern, which was right in the corner of where we were living at the time. Um, he also signs his things. People try. He has land in um, Northfield. He has land in Sunderland because he, he managed to get some, and he has this land in Gilbert. And they try to get him to, you know, sign with an X with one of the properties from Northfield. And you can see in one of the things where he actually smudges the ink out and he signs his name mm -hmm. to say, I know how to write my name. Um, and he does. Whether he could read much, I don't know. Lucy could read. We found her buying primers to teach the children. Well, we found that they bought a, a secretary's guide, which teaches you how to do almost anything you needed to do on your property, write documents, prune trees, all sorts of things. Um, and so we know she was literate and their children were. Um, we find them buying ink and paper and um, buy them bought a pair of glasses. Uh, so that we know he could at least sign his name and he might be able to read. One of the things that was very exciting was seeing that his son, Caesar, who spells his name very strangely, also signed some things. So we know that in the family there were some other things going on. Um, the, this is an account book we found. It all crumpled up. And this is the one thing that Anthony held, that Baiju had held. And in this was an account he had in Guilford. And we don't think that's his handwriting because it's done in a very educated way. We think one of his daughters may have kept his accounts for him. But you can see he was very entrepreneurial. He would um, write down these accounts. So here's someone who has uh, borrowed, his, um, borrowed his horse. Somebody else um, broke the yoke on his ox yoke. And so he's, he's billing him for damages. He would go down to Leiden, right across the border to Massachusetts, and buy things and sell them. So people put orders in, and then he would bring it back. Like somebody um, ordered half a cake of chocolate. <laughs> that one jumps out at you. Yeah. So he's, he's lived a good long life at this point. He's accomplished more than you can imagine. Um, here's one days of work, of, of work that he built somebody for. And so we know that he was, has, he did, he did entrepreneurial things in Deerfield, but we really get a sense of a man who took charge of his own life and who took charge of his property and, and, and taught his wife how to do some of the things. So what he, one of the things he had taught her was how to go to court. And he brought his kids into court too. So later, she goes to, to get an order of protection. She goes to the governor and council of Vermont, which is in Norwich, and she has to wait two or three days before there's a quorum, before she can try to present her petition. She does this, and um, after three days, they give her an order of protection to take home, so people can then make sure that they can't mess with them anymore. So she comes home. How she got all the way up there, we don't know. There were other lawyers in town. Um, and we think that she maybe just hitched a ride in the back of somebody's car. She goes up there, she gets this back. And then things are quiet for a long time. And then um, Baja dies, 88 years old. Mm -hmm. Lucy made it to almost 100. And, you know, it was quite amazing because we think about all of these things. We don't think what's possible. Because we know they had illnesses. In Deerfield, we found the medical records. And in those days, medical records <coughs> were not diagnoses. They were doctors would just write out an abbreviated Latin or Greek 
what they were uh, recommending that the person take, what the medication was. So Anthony took this um, listing of, of their accounts with the doctor, takes it to New York to the medical libraries, and looks up um, and has a Greek dictionary and a Latin dictionary in front of them. And he deciphers it, and we start finding, working backward. What did they? What would they prescribe this for? What would have happened? And we realized that Vija had been seriously injured at one point, probably dislocated his shoulder. Lucy, we think, um, had a really terrible childbirth, and she may have lost a child because there's a space in there where a child would have been born. And the doctor is coming and giving her things to try to get her through this, um, all of this. So we know that they've been through some serious physical things, and yet Baija lives to be 88 years old. Um, Lucy and her older sons decide, okay, well, he's got land in Sunderland. Let's just up and move. Because at this point, she just had what they call a widow's property, which is they give you a few acres, a five acres land, and you can grow, you know, crops just for yourself and the family. Um, and it's kind of called a widow's portion. And then um, just to keep herself going, because she's not going to run a 100-acre farm, and her sons aren't there anymore. So they said, you know what, let's just go to this property he's, he's got in Sunderland. So out they go, and we think this is where it was. This is an old photograph. Some people in Sunderland are trying to find it. Now, I think they think they found the red house with them. They get there, and what do they discover? That Eli Brownson, this man, owns their property. And they have no idea. And if you've read the book, you realize that, that um, they were basically swindled. They put people's names down, put the property names down, and then they uh, were supposed to advertise um, when they're going to have meetings about the properties. And they didn't advertise. We never, no one ever saw it. And then they could write the property off as abandoned, and then they would sell it to other people. And it didn't happen just to budget, it happened to others. And we found just all these shenanigans going on. So this man has, has bought this property. He has no idea that it, that it owned by anyone else, and what are we going to do, you know? So, you know, they tried to build a little cabin, they tried to cut some trees, that's just their son is kind of arrested, saying you're cutting people's trees down on other people's property. So what do they do? They do something fantastic, which is they go to court, <laughs> and we could not find the records. We could not find anything. We're sitting in the archives, in annex of the archives at the UVM library, and they have un, un um, catalog materials in these boxes. And so Anthony would sit there and he'd say, well, you take that pile, I'll take this pile. And of course, he had the right pile. And in there, <laughs> yeah. in there we find a one-page record from the um, Bronson's lawyer. And he's saying what days they went to court, what days happened, and it says their names at the top. So it's the sons who are taking the case. And Lucy is now an elderly woman, and she's going blind. She probably had cataracts, because she didn't. She was blind by the end of her life. And then there was one day that said, I did not argue this day. I did not argue it this day. And we think that's the day that Lucy probably was made her case for the sons. Um, and I think it's very likely that happened. We don't have a, a firm record, but we do know every court you know, they, they were traveling courts, so they only met, you know, every three months and that sort of thing. So she would go back and the sons would go back. But I just couldn't picture these sons kind of walking in into this court saying, you know, our father taught us how to do this and we're going to we're going to make sure that we get our land. Well, this is where we the, the town is flummoxed. They don't know what to do. They don't really think that they have an actual claim to that property, but they're not sure. They try every which way to make sure that they're foisted off into somebody else. They even suggest that maybe somebody who had owned Lucy would be responsible for her. Now, this is a woman who's probably in her 80s. Um, there's probably no one out there who had owned her. Um, and even then, it was when she was 25 or 26 or something. It was a long time. You know, obviously, that's not going to work. They try everything they can, and they cannot find someone. So they finally realize. Well, we're going to have to do something. And this is where when Anthony, bless his heart, found all the court records, all the town meeting records. You could see all the conversations that are being, people were having. 
what are we going to do? These people are here. They probably have some claim to it. How are we going to get them property? Do we have to give them property? Do they, can't they just go away? <laughs> and they, they're writing it all down, almost in real time. It was fascinating to read it. Um, and nobody had seen this at all. Um, finally, they do this. They decide to give them some land because the property is laid out. I have a clicker, but I, I don't feel like plugging in. If you look right in the middle of number 42, it says Negro. Mm -hmm. And that is the plot that they give Lucy. And they built a little house. They built a small house for her and her sons. <coughs> Festus, her son, has now married a white woman, um, also named Lucy. And they have kids. And they move in to the property. Caesar is now quite getting quite old. And he's there. One of the daughters, two of the daughters are there, Sil, Drusilla, who also wrote poetry, apparently, and Deruxa, who had um, become, as they called it in the records, a lunatic when, and when she was an adolescent. Nobody knows exactly what happened, but she, something happened in May. I've talked to doctors, I said, is this hormonal? What happened? You know, they don't know. Um, but I'll, I have to end up later, I will tell you a quick story about Deruxa and what we found out. It's kind of fabulous. Um, so they move into this property, and the town starts to support them, basically. They, they bring them firewood. They get the, the women each get a new dress made for them every year. Um, they take care of her. And she, in turn, is beloved by the town. People love her. She's articulate. She tells stories, just like she did in Deerfield with the children around her. They know that she um, has memorized the Bible. They said memorize the Bible. I suspect she memorized the New Testament and not the Old Testament because she can no, no longer read. And it's just thought line. And they think she's just wonderful, and they're very supportive of her. Down the road in Manchester is the Reverend Manuel Hayes, who was a mixed race minister. He ended up moving to New York later. But he, when she dies, which is in 1821. He does her funeral um, eulogy. She was nearly 100. Um, and to think about this story beginning in 1706 <coughs> with the birth of Baja, and then Lucy at this long age. So I know this, we're probably out of time. I know we're all right. I'm going to leave some time for some questions and answers. Um, but I will tell you um, the story of Darusa, and then I will read this last poem for you. And the story of Darusa was I found we I found this in a newspaper or a magazine from around that time, and they said amazing story or strange story happens in Sunderland. Well, it turns out after you know Lucy is is gone, she's you know, dead and gone. Um, the others, the young, the sons and the grandchildren, some of them are still living there. By the way, they call the other Lucy and Festus' children, they call them the white Negroes. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, this is what happens with your mixed race, I guess. They don't know what else to call them. Um, so they, they had this story where, so the parents are dead and gone. Baja has not been out here ever. And apparently she's been bedridden or, you know, just not quite accomplishmentous for most of her life. And she's now an elderly woman, too. And then one day, she woke up. She just woke up. She got up, and she, they, and she started walking around. And she's perfectly sane. <laughs> Not, nobody knows what happens. So she, they, they can just imagine this story where she just gets up and says, OK, we're, we're mom and dad. <laughs> they died about 60 years ago. <laughs> Um, and they have her walk around. I can just picture her. Mm -hmm. Apparently, she took a couple of tours around the house and in the outside. She came back in, got back in the bed, and died. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! <laughs> Which I think was just the most amazing yeah. story when I found that. We don't know how it happened. Nobody knows. But she was with them nearly to the end, and then she woke up enough to. And I can imagine. Did they all just say, "Oh, look at we're living in Sunderland now"? You know, back in Deerfield. <laughs> In catching up with everything, and then she was gone. I think it's incredible. Oh, yeah. This poem I love, mm. and this is a poem by uh, Gail uh, Jackson, who was, I think she may still be, a Goddard um, professor. And this, I always just think, is the perfect way to end. 
I should preface it by saying, after um, Lucy, before she went blind, she made an annual trip back to Guilford to visit Bodge's grave. Mm -hmm. And so this is a poem commemorating that. Now she appears, an old woman, cresting a mountain on horseback, the horizon at the summit familiar as the climb. But at her age, she considers it will not be many more times back and forth, twice a year to his grave, and the town where parts of their stories rest not in peace, but at least on their own, in their own ground. August was the 25th, 1746. What they remember was their own history, rhymed on the lips of a stolen child, bearing her slaved treasure, her own polished pain hiding a gift in her mouth, storyteller, troublemaker, Caesar, Drusilla, Tatne, Derutza, Abijah Jr. Marriage bought her out, and those children were more to fight for. Two of the boys of the war, girl losing her mind in poems, what they remember was their own, she'd remember hers. The names of whom I'll not leave out. The wind runs with her, its mane tossing round each name, and Bige's brook winks water in sight of her property. A tune in her head, a voice on the mind of her memory, all gone over her shoulder, over green mountains, over and over, since that day in a net without her mother, without her father, since that ship, since she stood and stood again to stand, the Lord knows, it's a long way from where she started. Mm -hmm. I find this so moving. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. answer one question that everybody always asks, and my answer has changed over the last several years, or the last two years. Mm -hmm. The, the, the question always was, did they have descendants? Are there people still living who were descended from Bajan Lucy? I assure you that anybody ever heard anybody last name Prince in Vermont has written to me over the last <laughs> 10, 10 years saying, oh, there was a prince there. Yes, he was a white man who owned a store. I mean, this, so there, there was no way to find them. The daughters did not marry. The sons married. Caesars um, had a child who died. And then Abijah Jr. also, he lived in Hartford for a while. His child, he had a child who died. Um, if the, the girls, if they had married, would have, their names would have changed and we would have lost them. So we started to lose them all. Tatne actually didn't have children. He um, was a survivor of what they thought was, you know, the plague came around and he survived. And so he was nursing people and of course he caught it and died. Um, so we thought there's nobody. I, I traced back one person, in a map, um, African American man who fought the Civil War. We think was the one. And then I met a woman in Greenwich, which they, how they pronounce it, Greenwich, New York, which is right over the border from Saratoga County. And she was a genealogist, and she threw herself into this for years, and then finally she found the descendants. I have not read it yet, but she sent me, they sent me a copy, it's in the Vermont Magazine, the Vermont, what's it called, Historical Review, and she lines up who she found. So we knew there were some, mm -hmm. um, and we don't know where they are. The other thought had been that had Festus's children, the white Negroes, had they had children, they more likely would have also married into the white local population and then over the next hundred years or two, they're, they're indistinguishable from, from the others. So that was one thought, that there may be others, you know, we don't know about, but we can't be sure. But that's the story of who's out there now. And I assure you, I have not descended from <laughs> So let's have some questions. You read the book, what, do you, what, what struck you? Well, I don't have a question, but I just was so, um, taken back by how much research you had to do. For, you know, this this isn't that big of a book, but no. there was so much research that went into it, and how wonderful for you to have your husband helping you because, with I mean, it seemed like you you only took two to get this this information. So I'm just I'm just in awe of how what what went into this. It was really quite incredible, and it was it was. Um, 
I highly recommend it for a marriage <laughs> <laughs> to have a, a shared project. project or, you know, and then we were, you know, we were at it for years. Mm -hmm. And he would come back from wherever he was, and I would come back from wherever I was, and we'd sit on our porch in Guilford in the house we had built, and we'd say, here's what I found, what do you think? And we'd try to interpret everything we found in a ledger book or an account book, and match it up with all the court cases, and see, and I don't think I could have written as good a book alone. I think, he didn't do any of the writing, but he, his finds and just the way to, to have that. You know, we, we talked about it as a tale of two marriages. <laughs> and, then, right, and I never intended to write the book as a quest, but there wasn't that much known. And my publisher and my agent both said, you know, how are we gonna do this? We don't want it to be, you know, I had all, I had, you know, a ton of come to wars. We had, you know, in the uh, Penobscot. And I had everything, and they said, no, 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 you're not writing a history textbook. We want it to read like a novel. That's why all the footnotes are not numbered. It's full of, it's full of notes, like line notes at the back, meaning that you don't, they're, they're not numbered, but it'll tell you what page it's on, so that you know everything had a, a reason and it was a real fact. Um, but we didn't want to break it up by putting footnotes and making it look different. So I, came. I went to them and I said, well, what if I tell the story about how we found them and what we found? And they said, yes. So that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the right way. It was the right thing to do. Um, we, we couldn't have told it in any other way. And I think it's the one that makes people more interested. You know, how do you find it? How do you, how do you, you know, we didn't find everything in the exact order. Yeah. Of the book. You know, I mean, it was, yeah. Yeah, but it was, it was the right thing. Yeah. Doing all this research over years, how do you know when it's, Time to, stop. Stop. <laughs> Time to stop researching and start writing. Well, for one thing, I did have a job. <laughs> um, but you know what happened was my editor, who was very hands-on, she made me rewrite the book five times. Oh. And each time it got better. Um, but she was really in there with her pen, going at it. And finally she said, you know, we've done it. We've done it. And I tell all my students, when I make you revise a paper, you know, it does get better. And imagine writing a whole book five times, and each time it got better. And it made it, I wanted to make it alive rather than stagnant. And then I think we weren't ready to stop. And we were still looking. You know, we keep still hoping that we'll find something. Um, you, you, ears and eyes are already open. I talked to the family who owns the property, who's had it for a long time, so they've made some discoveries and, so that are important. And we all, you know, just kind of share this, this, this quest. Um, there is a street sign at the end of their street, and it, they had to be really careful because um, teenagers who kept stealing it, you know, because I do. We had a prize at Prince Road that was really good of it. <laughs> yeah, but that's how you stop. You just have to stop at some yeah. point. You have to say, I may not find enough to change this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any connection to Hadley in the story? Yeah, there's a couple of mentions of Hadley. Mm -hmm. yeah. But only when they yeah. concerned the princes directly. Because like, he, he stayed in Hadley for a bit. We called him, we called it, we probably can't say that today, but we used to quietly call it the, the Vijas Negro Network because he knew a lot of these people. Um, Ralph Way, is, um, who was fascinating, not only because he was an African-American early property owner, and he had, ended up with a lot of property in his family, but he had the first divorce in Massachusetts. <laughs> and, um, so he's in there. And I think as Wyatt just starts to travel with certain people and live with some of them, he begins to see that it's possible to have a different kind of life. So this area was very important. I mean, I didn't talk about the Porter Phelps house, and I didn't talk about everybody, but we tracked down every place that we know he had stayed, because we would find him in the town of Wolves, or sometimes getting worn out, you know, the warning out, so that he would sometimes have to leave after a while. He worked for someone, I think he made hats in Northampton. He worked for someone there. Um, so we know that he stayed around in this area quite often for a few years. Um, so yeah, Hadley 
my students, when I tell them, by the way, they, there were enslaved people here, and there were black people living here, they go, what? Yeah. 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 And when, I went, when the book was first published, I would, uh, did a lot of radio interviews, not so much locally, but you know, nationally. And the first thing that would happen was the people at the southern stations wanted me to say, see, you weren't so bad. We had slavery up here, too. And I said, you know, it's a matter of degree. <laughs> Um, it's a little different. And we did run across several suicides of enslaved people. Um, one of Stephen Williams' enslaved people that they had been doctoring and taking wonderful care of. Um, you know, he finally died, but another one threw himself in their well. Oh. That's not a happy, you know, serve. Yeah. Um, and you couldn't run away because it's so rural that you're going to be noticed. You can't just you know, disappear into the city streets like you could in Philadelphia. Or some did though. Yes, some ran away. And, and we also found the other thing that was really interesting was that um, how many uh, people would feel that if you were a successful person, a minister yeah. or a businessman, that you needed to own a servant. So we found, I found a case where the, the congregation took up a collection in order to buy a slave for their minister, mm -hmm. so they could better the community. Yeah, the first four, the first four ministers in Hadley all had slaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. The whole so area. the whole area. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But again, I just tried to give some context to Baijiu and what he was doing. I need to have a cough drop. So if somebody has a question. I've been talking since seven this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, had, had to do two interviews for the Guardian at 7.30 or 8 this morning because they wanted me to talk because I write about Black Britain. Mm. All these shows like Bridgerton. <laughs> I, I do talk about that. And, uh, yeah, and the Queen Charlotte. <laughs> and now the Cleopatra. And so, yeah. so yeah, I was on the phone for a long time today and then I talked. <laughs> okay, is there one last question? I thought I saw another hand up. Yes. yes. I have a question. I was wondering how you're doing on your memoir. Oh, the memoir. Yeah. You know, I'm writing two books. And the book I'm writing now that I got the grants for is about black women in early Britain and before the 20th century. And I'm particularly looking at black or mixed race women who married white Englishmen in England. Um, there was never laws against any of that. There were no miscegenation laws. And of course, the English, so there was no slavery, but they were selling them in coffee shops. And, um, but um, I, I had to rewrite that book. I had written it 25 years ago, and then it turned out that a lot of people were still interested. So I rewrote the whole book last year, um, and I had to do a lot more research. It's called Black England. In England, they're looking for an American it was called Black London in America, and it ain't Black England there. So I redid it in England. In fact, it ended up with the original publisher, which was kind of cool. Um, and so I had to rewrite the whole thing with all the new research that I and other people had done to bring it up to date. And um, I have, it was really kind of wonderful because Zadie Smith offered to write an introduction. So that's the, the foreword to that book is now done by Zadie Smith, and she published it in The Guardian, which was great. Um, so this stuff is in the air now. They, they, they told me I wrote it before it was, it was time to write it. They said it was, you know, but people are receptive and open to it. And whenever people ask me about Bridgerton, I said, well, you know, the cool thing about that is they're asking what if, what if England looked like that? Um, and that would be fun. But now people are doing other things where they're the, the viewers actually believe these things are actual history. And they actually think this is the way it happened. And I'm, so we're, we're very concerned that all this work we do as people who find this history and find the archives and find the facts is now being taken over by some image on, on Netflix um, in a very different way. So I, that's kind of my mission right now is to make sure that the you know, the facts are actually kind of more interesting than the other stuff. That wasn't the question, was it? No, no. Oh, the <laughs> memoir. Um, the memoir. Um, the memoir, I, I've written about 100 pages of it, and it, it's about growing up mixed race in Springfield. 
And I think it's mostly turning more to be about my mother, who was a very interesting person. And uh, it's called, the subtitle is, I'm calling it Ghost Story now. The, uh, the Ghost House, not Ghost Story, Ghost House, because well, there are reasons for that. Um, and, the, and the subtitle is Growing Up on the Corner of Black and White. And at the time, nowadays, no, when I was growing up, there were only two mixed interracial marriages in Springfield that we knew of. There were no, I only knew of no families, actually, when I was growing up that had, had mixed race children, um, just one family. And it was a very different time. But I also want to think about the kinds of things we thought about growing up that we took for granted, not just in terms of race, but if, for instance, I say that I, I grew up like thinking I was a Victorian <laughs> because, in, I mean, it was a house built in that period, but um, it was, you know, in front of our house when I was growing up was the, was the um, kitchen post and the block, you know, for people to step down. And slowly over time, all of these places start to disappear. They started, you know, they took off the hitching posts, but they were they were great. A lot of the houses had them. The house on the corner had a three-story barn, which is it's gone now. And this is in town. Um, you know, we grew up. You know, I I I, I on May Day, I would run around and put flowers on people's porch because I was a, one of those kids who read everything. The books, like all the little May books and all the the twins books. So I said, oh, and of course nobody knew what I was doing, especially when <laughs> the next door neighbors who were from Poland had no idea <laughs> uh, why I was leaving flowers on the 1st of May. Um, but I, that's the things I read, and those are the things that were around, and I, you know, I slowly over time, every tree in our street, which is a beautifully tree-lined street, has been torn down, has been cut down. It's just like a concrete jungle, and the heat bears down on it, and that's gone. The house was a Victorian house, and in it, I call it ghost house because my mother not only had all these archives, but she had huge boxes of photographs going back to tintypes from the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, all my white ancestors who would be shocked to see that I'm the one who tells their story now. <laughs> um, they're, you know, they, so I really felt when, after she passed away, I felt like the weight of all this history and the ancestors were on my shoulders. These people whose photographs I know, I have diaries of the women who, you know, in the 1860s, who were sort of pioneer farm owning women in Michigan. Um, and these were my side of the family. My mother hired a genealogist in the South to try to track down my father's family, and we found them on a enslaved on a plantation in North Carolina. So we know where they were. But one of the interesting things is that you know, I'm a, I'm a hundreds of years back a tuttle like everybody else. You know, there, there are millions of them now. You know, everybody had ten kids and their kids had ten kids. So um, but is the ship they came over in sixteen thirty five and the ship that brought them over at the same time there was another ship passing and it was the first Holbrook. And but he never owned enslaved people. In fact he ended up going back. But I just saw these two threads coming together at the same time and ending up in an unlikely place. I will say I left Springfield as soon as I was old enough. My mother would have been amazed to know that I'm living back in this area. Now this is not the plan. I had my bags packed by the front door on my 18th birthday. I said I am leaving. I don't know where I'm going, San Francisco. No, I went to college. Um, but then I moved. I lived in three countries and five states. Um, never in a million years thought I'd be back here. So now I have to write about the house. <laughs> and all those people who are still hanging around in there, I have to put them to rest. Uh, any last questions? I, I just really enjoy the book. I enjoy learning about you in this journey. And I, I enjoyed learning about what it was like here. Um, I'm fascinated in part because I'm a direct descendant of Nathaniel Dickens, who was mm -hmm. one of that group who came right. from Weathersfield here. Right. And I am now thinking it's highly likely I have ancestors who bought people. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. It, I, and and I, that's a question I had. I go to these Dickinson family reunions, and everybody's white. Yeah. Of course, and I and I'm not sure if they want to have that conversation, but. I'm wondering what I might do to find that out. I don't have time to people are, people are much more open to those conversations yeah. than they used to be. And when I every time I speak someplace, they are really interested. They really are. They want to know the past. I mean there are some strange stories of people not wanting to know, but it's very rare now. I think now people are just saying, Oh, it gives me another perspective. I mean I thought it was all Johnny Tremaine and you know, and all of this and um, but I think people are very open. Historic Deerfield has finally taken this on. And all they have Deerfield reunions all the time with the Deerfield descendants. And they're all white. Um, uh, because the enslaved people died. You know, they didn't have families, most of them. Um, but I, my sense is that people are very fascinated by this and the, their family passed. And they, they were not the ones responsible for doing it, but they would like to know what their, their ancestors did. I think so. And so, you know, you might sleuth some more. They're hard to find, though. <laughs> Don't take seven years. It takes a while. <laughs> one last one. Any last one? Before I go home and eat dinner? <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking. Thank you. Thank you.